Good evening, everybody, and welcome from wherever in the world you are joining us. Um, I think we are very fortunate tonight to have quite a global audience, and we certainly have a global panel of speakers with us tonight. So just before we start, I'm going to play a quick introduction video to show you how the platform works and to help you to have an enjoyable evening with us. So sit back and relax, and here's a four-minute video, and then we'll get started. Thank you everybody for your attention with that. Um, so just a quick recap. 
please note that you are welcome to post your questions during the webinar. You'll see on the right side of your screen there's a little questions tab. You can just click on that questions tab, enter your questions, and we will have a nice panel discussion and Q&A answer at the end of this webinar as well. And then you're welcome to chat with us in the chat function. If you experience any issues with your sound or video, so it seems like your screen is standing still or frozen, please know that you can just refresh your browser and you'll be right back into the room. If everything around you is dark, you're probably in load shedding and we cannot assist in that, in that with you. So please know that we're also recording this webinar and you are welcome to watch the replay at any time. And this will also be published on the YouTube town channel by tomorrow morning. So with that, I would like to introduce your head speaker or your guest speaker for today, Dr. Neil Forbes, who is based in the UK. Um, and he said it's nice and warm there, um, but he is still an African by heart. And he owns property in our land and spends as much time here as he possibly can. And he also gives his time and expertise freely to causes such as the vulture conservation and the training of vets in avian orthopedic techniques. He is a diplomat at the European College of Zoological Medicine and a recognized specialist in avian medicine. Teaching is second nature to Neil, and he has lectured internationally for many, many years and has contributed to over 65 peer-reviewed papers and more than 38 books. Even though we all know he's a very, very humble person and he does not want us to elaborate too much on his bio or his resume, he has a really, really impressive career and his contribution to the veterinary profession. And he, he actually prefers to be called retired, even though we do know that he doesn't really ever retire from full-time clinical work, but he keeps himself busy with consultancy work revolving around zoo, local authority and wealth inspections, as well as trainings and also teaching. He is involved with the expert witness roles, captive breeding and conservation projects, such as the Hubara busted and critically endangered species of vulture. He is also the victory advisor to Health and Hygiene, who is the sponsor for this event. And we would like to thank Health and Hygiene for making it possible for everybody to be able to attend tonight free of charge. And we are very, very privileged and honored to have him and the team for this presentation. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Neil. Good evening, everybody. Corne, if I could just have access to the presentation, please. I need to like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's wonderful. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's fantastic to see people logging on from all over the world, um, Hong Kong, America, um, the Middle East, um, uh, all, China, all sorts of places. You're very, very welcome, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy this. Uh, we are really excited to be doing this. As Corne has mentioned, um, the three of us here are coming from different uh, parts of the world with different experiences, and that's hopefully what will make some of it uh, fun for you. So just to, to introduce my fellow presenters, um, firstly, in, in alphabetical order, we have Dr. Hamish Barron. Uh, he's a registered avian specialist. Uh, through the Australian and New Zealand College of Veterinary Scientists. He carried out his undergraduate training at the University of Queensland, where he also completed a rotating internship in small animal medicine and surgery before taking up a position at the University of Sydney as director of the Avian, Reptile and Exotic Pet Hospital. Later, he carried out his residency in avian medicine and surgery through the University of Sydney, during the residency, Dr. Barron undertook training in Sydney, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Brisbane, and Melbourne before passing his specialist examinations in 2019. Dr. Barron is currently undertaking his Doctor of Philosophy through the University of Sydney, investigating novel treatment modalities for Macrorhabdus ornithogaster. Uh, some may still know that as uh, megabacteria or avian gastric yeast. Dr. Barron is a director of the Unusual Pet Vets Australia and works in the P Peninsula Clinic in Victor Victoria, Australia. So welcome, Hamish, and uh, we, we will involve discussion between the, the three of us as the presentation goes through. And then the third um, of the Musketeers is Dr. Dirk Vervut, uh, who's well known in both South Africa and the Middle East as a veterinary communities for all things avian and animal health related. He holds a BSc in nature conservation, a BVSc with honors in poultry diseases, and an MSc in animal human ecosystem health. He held senior positions at Honor Support Poultry Reference Laboratory, as well as the Veterinary Institute, during which time he was the international consultant to many animal production projects in Saudi Arabia. 
Dirk has also spent some time in industry as a technical manager for Pfizer, and for the last 11 years, he has been responsible for the production and health of some 4 million cattle at Caron Beef. During Dirk's entire career, he has been, and still is, involved with falconry, breeding raptors, cytosine, softbills, waterfowl, and galliforms. He has also been involved with research related to commercial ostrich production and various avian infectious conditions of falcons and poultry. He has a particular interest in biosecurity and disinfection, in intensive animal production systems, in large cytosine breeding operations, and in relation to import and export avian quarantine facilities. So welcome Dirk and Hamish, fantastic to have you guys along with us. Okay, so we're just going to rattle through a uh, presentation and we're going to involve my two colleagues and, and uh, discuss things. And obviously, as Cornelia said, uh, we've got some polls during the presentation and a question and answer session at the end. So just to kick things off, obviously, it gives me great pleasure to be involved with this. And as Cornelia said, my role uh, as veterinary advisor for health and hygiene um, is, is a really nice position to have, having used the products and having great confidence and faith in them for over a 20-year period. So a lot of people ask me, well, what makes F10 different? And the key things are that there is safety testing of all finished products by government-accredited quality controlled laboratories for both skin, oral, dermal, and inhalation safety. There is efficacy testing of all finished products by, again, government accredited quality controlled laboratories. And there's considerable information, both testimonials, but also all the safety, efficacy, and application instructions, and much, much more is available on the Health and Hygiene website. We believe in being evidence-based and being very open. And that means that all the efficacy and safety data sheets and the results are available to all members of the profession and, you, and, and animal keepers on the health and hygiene website, uh, available through these links here. Equally, the dilution rates and contact times specific to different pathogens are detailed here. And all the application guidelines are also provided. It's true to say that health and hygiene provides added value to all their products across this range with training and education both of distributors, clients and users with this and similar presentations together with the comprehensive fact packed website. Okay, so just so you guys all get used to being involved, because I'm not doing all the work tonight, uh, we have a first poll question here. Uh, and in this poll, unlike the rest, in this poll, you tick all of the answers that are applicable to you. So it's not just one answer, it's, it's as many uh, up to five that are applicable to you. So the first, A, I am aware of F10 and use at least one product. B, I only use F10 products for cleaning and biosecurity. In other words, I don't use them for treatment. I only use them for cleaning and biosecurity. C, I use F10 products for disinfection and also for patient treatments. D, I wasn't aware that F10 products were licensed for patient treatments. And E, I use F10 by fogging on a regular routine basis. So, if you can poll your, your answers now and just remind you, answer yes to as many of those as are applicable to yourself. And just to let everybody know, um, to access the poll, which you'll see on the right side of your screen, where your sidebar is, where you have placed in your chats and have been networking. The next tab is a questions tab, and then you've got the polls tab, and then I have a little red dot next to it. So you just click on the polls tab, and you can choose all the applicable answers there. So we have about 44 votes in so far, Dr. Forbes. Um, we do have over 100 people online, so the votes are anonymous, so nobody will fail or, or get a golden star for a correct answer. So you're welcome to, to cast your votes now. I see it's climbing up to about 51 votes now. And so far, our biggest votes or the most votes go to number C, um, disinfection and patient treatment, which is quite good followed by um, number A, I'm aware of F10 and use at least one of their products. 
a very, very low percentage wasn't aware that F10 products were licensed for patient treatment. That's so great. Only, th That's only three percent of, of our online audience. So it seems to be closing down there. Um, if you would like to close the poll, we can do that in about three seconds. So last okay. minute votes. Okay, so the good news from that is that a lot of you guys are aware that we can use F10 products for treatment and I'm really particularly pleased to see that, okay, only 20%, but that's, that's still good. 20% of people are using F10 for fogging on a regular routine basis and this is one key point we're going to get back to later on in the presentation. Okay, so let's, let's move on from there. Um, we're going to start off looking at some respiratory cases. Um, and uh, these are just cases that I've dealt with, but they, they bring out specific important points. So treating here a yellow-fronted Amazon parrot um, with a sinusitis. And the, the issue here was that the bird had a highly a multiple antibiotic resistant Klebsiella um, in, in the sinuses. Um, and so obviously we took a culture and sensitivity, but we flushed the sinuses on a daily basis whilst using systemic therapy as well. But it's it, adding F10 into the treatment protocol is a good way of trying to get around the antimicrobial resistance. So there's just some images, obviously parrots, we always think about chlamydia as well when we've got upper respiratory problems, but just to remind us that the whole range of different avian species can suffer from sinusitis. And treating systemically with tablets or, or uh, injections just simply isn't enough. You need to clear out those sinuses. As someone who's suffered from sinus, sinus, sinusitis myself, I know you've got to flush out that sinus. So just remembering when you're flushing out, you always hold that bird's head down, as you can see in the, the, the image here, head down uh, the uh, syringe against the nair with the mouth open so that basically as you flush through with that fluid, it comes into the mouth and it will come out of the bird's open mouth, not be inhaled into the respiratory system. So bilateral 10 mils of flush with F10 SC 1 in 250 via each nares. And we generally do that uh, each day, uh, once a day for 7 to 14 days. And some, some owners can do that happily at home. Um, some cases it has to be, the bird has to be hospitalized, but a fantastically useful treatment. And then we move on to rhinoliths. Um, we see these regularly in the UK, uh, and I'm just going to ask for some input from Hamish and Dirk in a moment, uh, because it'll be interesting to see whether they see this problem in, in birds in uh, Africa and in Australia relatively. Um, but this is just, uh, we get this concreation of exudate in the nares, a great big hard buildup, uh, and we need to anesthetize the bird, break up the mass. It's too big, it gets big, the diameter of it gets bigger inside the nares, so it's too big to just pull out. You have to break it out and remove it. And there is always a local infection underneath that, uh, that lump of rubbish. Um, so yes, you always collect a swab for cultural sensitivity, but whilst you're waiting for that result, we would always start either flushing or or just getting the owner to drip F10 SE 1 in 250 into that cavity daily for a 10 to 14 day period, and then adding in either antifungal or antibiotic treatment, uh, whatever is relevant based on the test we have. So Dirk and Hamish, can I ask you, because I'm, I'm just interested, is this something that you see uh, in, in your, your areas of avian work medicine? Dirk, you, you respond first. Okay, thanks, Neil. Um, yeah, um, look, I'm working more with big populations than, than the single patient. But if I see something like this, and I have that, done that, it's fairly common in African greys, for example, big co collections of African greys. Uh, it really goes back to a nutritional imbalance, uh, specifically zinc and vitamin A. Uh, yep. Normally, is, is a part of that uh, ground sort of uh, problem. And what you see as a rhinolith is the end stage of a process. So you're trying to work things back. You're trying to resolve a problem uh, that's immediately in front of you with a single patient, but also in the flock sense, address the nutritional aspects. Um, sure. and, and that's sure. my approach usually. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Hamish, you got anything to add, to add to the story? Yeah, the only thing that I add, in Australia, we see a lot of smaller citizens. And so I mostly deal with the individual bird rather than the flock collection. So it's a good perspective. But one of the things that um, I always found difficult was trying to get a good seal with the F10 so you could actually flush that sinus and, and actually infuse the F10 into the, the, the sinus itself. Sure. And so what I've started using is the small rubber 
rubber syringe stoppers yep. that you normally yep. use to keep material and you just make a little hole in the end of those yep. and that applies against the nostril you get a really nice smell and you can actually sure. flush a lot of material out the coin yep. and so yep. um yep. yeah that's basically the only input that i have there that that's great. Thanks, guys. I, I'm completely with you, Dirk, that, you know, that there's just going to be an underlying nutritional problem there. That's, you know, remember, vitamin A in particular is responsible for uh, maintaining, uh, preventing infection of the respiratory and, and oral uh, area. Um, okay, so moving on from there, we just move on to aspergillosis prevention, first of all. Aspergillus occurs when a bird is challenged by an overwhelming spore load or a bird is stressed so that the immune system is suppressed so that the bird can no longer cope with a level of spores that it would normally meet and cope with on a day-to-day -day basis. So the key point from my point of view is if you anticipate the bird or the group of birds are going to be stressed, perhaps they're going to be transported or they're going through quarantine or they're starting initial training, then actually fogging the room where the birds are being housed maybe three times a day for 30 minutes to not only reduce the spore load in the air, but also to treat any spores that have entered the upper respiratory tract. Systemic therapy, obviously, if you've got, if we move on to think about treatment of aspergillosis, then obviously we would always use systemic antifungal therapy as well, uh, but of, of course maintain the fogging or better still nebulization using F10SC1 and 250, or Alternatively, if you've got large individual lesions in the uh, caudal air sacs, uh, or even the anterior air sacs come to that, actually going in there endoscopically and spraying the lesions um, topically with uh, the F10SE 1 and 250 uh, directly onto the lesions. So just a, a couple of images here. The, the one at the bottom here shows you uh, the syrinx. This is an endoscopic view down the trachea, and we can see little the start of little uh, aspergillus lesions here. And the top one, where the trachea, the syrinx is almost totally blocked. This bird came in going, eh, eh, really struggling to breathe. And of course, we need to put an air sac breathing tube in there straight away. And then the image on the right is, is sadly a, a, a cadaver case. Uh, but showing you the, the terrible pathology that goes on in these aspergillus uh, clinical cases. So let's just have number two poll now, please. Um, and I'll just read through them um, again. So which one statement is most accurate in respect of aspergillosis in birds? A. Aspergillus species grows on damp vegetable material, but once the vegetable material is dry, it is no longer a disease risk. B, Aspergillus species are ubiquitous. Disease occurs when either birds are immune suppressed or are challenged by overwhelming levels of environmental spores. Or C, Aspergillus species is pathogenic to birds, but is not a zoonotic disease risk. D, Aspergillus species spores are readily controlled by all standard household or veterinary disinfectants. And E, any veterinary disinfectant can be used effectively and safely by fogging or nebulization. So if we go to the pond, remember, it's only, I, we want you to just choose the one most accurate answer here so just tick one answer so if you can uh, poll away so the polls are open and um, votes are coming in 46 votes cards have cost so far 90 percent 96 percent of the votes sorry oh. is for option b <laughs> oh good so no one's fallen asleep yet that's great mm -hmm. well done guys so just just looking through those obviously the 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 answer b everyone's answering which you know is correct because i've already said that aspergillus <laughs> we look at a aspergillus grows on damp vegetable material. yes it certainly does but once it's dry it's no longer a disease risk that's totally wrong once it's dry it is still a disease risk um, aspergillus, so answer D, aspergillus spores are readily controlled by all standard household veterinary disinfectants. That's not correct. You need a specific antifungal or a, a disinfectant that has antifungal properties. Um, C, aspergillus species of pathogenic birds. Yes, it is, but is not a zoonotic risk. That's incorrect. Certainly in, immune compromised humans can suffer from aspergillosis. And then E, 
any veterinary disinfectant can be used effectively and safely by fogging or nebulization. That's not true. Uh, the vast majority of, of standard disinfectants are corrosive to metal, and that means you can't use them in a fogger, um, and, and some of them you can't use on a nebulizer, depending on the design. So, so there we are. That's some interesting little points. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Dirk now, and he's going to talk you through uh, the next few slides which are relevant to his uh, experience. Thanks, Neil. Uh, just before I kick off with biosecurity, I'd like to emphasize something that you've said just now on the Aspergillus, which is uh, incredibly important. Uh, a lot of these situations are really predictable. Uh, you know, in a, in a situation, in an environment and so on, where you have this accumulated uh, vegetative material and so on, and also in the individual um, life of, of a bird. 20 years ago in the Middle East, uh, we were faced with a particular issue with Aspergillosis esaculitis in Jure falcons, and uh, we started fogging them and, and really nebulizing during the first phase of training when they're really highly stressed. You're still taming them down, you're getting them fit, and you, 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 you're flying them in the desert, and it's really a stressful period. And many of them come down with the Aspergillosis esaculitis because of that. And we started fogging them really after each training session with tremendous results with F10, of course. So uh, the, the point is that there's a lot of prediction in this. And you can use F10 in a, in a preventative manner, uh, particularly with yeah, Aspergillus esaculitis. But anyway, um, biosecurity, you know, is a, uh, is a topic that normally when we start talking about it, we, we start with a textbook approach and we say something like biosecurity stands on two legs. Uh, one is biocontainment, keep pathogens in, and the other is by exclusion, keep pathogens out. But it's really a mindset. It's a, it's a management principle and it's a way of looking at things. And in essence, it is a risk mitigation strategy. And if we think about risk, always remember that risk in fact stand on two legs and it is likelihood and impact. Uh, but I find it's not a good way to start talking to clients that way. I normally start very basic, uh, really break it down to the absolute basic principle that the outcome of an infectious disease, whether it's in a um, single patient or a population, is the net result of the balance between level of resistance and level of challenge. Now, level of resistance is where a lot of disciplines come together, from nutrition uh, to the immunity to uh, stress management, husbandry, and so on. So, so that's not the topic of this evening's talk. Uh, tonight we're looking at biosecurity and disinfection. And this is where F10 is an incredibly powerful weapon in our, in our toolbox. So if we think about reservoirs, hosts, environments, and so on, certain disease-specific aspects, but it all comes down to level of challenge that we want to be, uh, get as low as possible. In the next slide, we can make it a bit more complicated and uh, we can explain the introduction of the infectious agent agent with a susceptible host as a chain a chain of events that we can break we can clip those single um, parts of the of the chain and first of all of course we can destroy the infectious agent whether it's a virus or bacteria or whatever uh, but then there's a reservoir issue and never forget that we're looking at buildings, infrastructure, uh, utensils, feed, water bowls, um, and, and all of those. And again, as Neil, as, as Neil has suggested, aerosol and fogging, a tremendously powerful way of delivering our disinfectant to places where you cannot normally reach. Do not forget biofilm, uh, usually in a water reticulation system, but even as in your face, literally as anesthetic masks. Uh, people, clothes, shoes, and so on. Um, when we enter, for example, a uh, import-export uh, quarantine situation, we shower or we go through a fogging um, little room type of situation. So the reservoir can be addressed quite effectively with a uh, F10 approach. Of course, there are portals or mechanisms of, of exit uh, out of this reservoir. Again, aerosol, droplets. I mean, uh, we live in a time where there's a tremendous emphasis on masks and aerosol transmission of coronavirus and so on. And coronavirus really is one of the easiest viruses to kill. In our world, where we live in with animals, we're looking at parvovirus, a non-enveloped virus in a mixed animal setting. Uh, clinic and so on, which is incredibly difficult to kill. 
A better example in agriculture and, and avian medicine would be citizen beacon feather disease syndrome, the circo virus. Again, a very, very difficult and complicated uh, target. So uh, it is shared by aerosol. It is also shared in feather dust. So the whole approach of fogging uh, with F10 is, is very, very effective. Uh, transmission obviously is then broken or not. And uh, always remind our clients that there is a decision tree in terms of this, uh, deciding which uh, disinfectant is best fit for purpose. And uh, explain that there is something called a concentration contact time uh, principle. Uh, higher concentration means lower contact time because we're looking first of all at efficacy. Second, uh, obviously safety. And uh, as Neil has emphasized also tissue friendly and environmental friendly. We're usually working with very, very expensive infrastructure. Uh, in a surgical setting with, uh, for example, or, or in a, uh, a rearing room, for example, incubators and, and brooders and so on. A very expensive infrastructure. You cannot, and I see this sometimes, people still advise you to use a, a pure glutaral right, for example, to disinfect your, your incubators. It's madness. You'll uh, corrode uh, very sensitive instruments in there. Uh, the susceptible host, uh, of course, there's a lot of management issues we can do there. There's immunization in certain diseases, uh, prophylactic medication with uh, doxycycline, for example, with um, onothosis, chlamydiosis, and so on. So there are many specific situations where we can use other tools. But, but the message here is that there are several opportunities to break that chain of transmission using a fit for purpose disinfectant like F10. In the next slide, we can get to a few specific cases and depending on the situation, we can delve into a lot of detail. Uh, certain uh, activities that we as veterinarians do and our clients uh, are really a high risk or a zero tolerance situation. And it's almost a HACCP uh, mentality and we're all familiar with ASAP, that's as it is analysis of critical control points. So we're looking at very difficult to destroy agents as targets. Uh, and from there on, we know that everything else is covered, basically. So I mentioned the incubator hatching room situation, uh, baby rooms and rearing of chicks. Uh, you know, we've got different species sometimes, they often together, in fact, different ages. And, and really the biosecurity principles of keeping things dedicated and cleaning uh, between every procedure. In hospitals, uh, respiratory ward is a good idea. In the Middle East, uh, where we have a lot of uh, respiratory infections, not only aspergillus, also viruses, uh, Newcastle, avian influenza, uh, and so on in the Falcons, uh, in cytosine, cytosine beacon feather disease, and so on. So a area that is really dedicated to that syndrome is a very good idea. We often have brooder ICU boxes where you can control oxygen, temperature, and so on. And that really allows you to do fogging therapy also. Do not forget that. Quarantine facilities, several places, all in, all out, washing. And in my experience, one of the big uh, mistakes that's often made is uh, that air conditioning units are ignored. They're not properly cleaned. You can have a impregnated foam at the air conditioning in and outlet, but really cleaning them out, dismantling them literally and cleaning them out. Otherwise, you sit with a reservoir situation. Circovar is the classic example. Feather dust accumulates in places where you just cannot imagine it does. So cleaning all of that. And uh, part of the HACCP uh, paradigm really is to monitor. So choose something that you use as an index organism, such as circovirus, beak and feather. Monitor that cleaning process. Take some PCR swabs, uh, make sure that it's clean. Do it again if it's not, and have that complete uh, loop, that feedback loop uh, when you do this. Thanks, Neil. Thanks very much in, indeed, Dirk. And, um, uh, you know, d discussing the, um, the control of these large breeding groups is, is really, really important. This slide here um, relates to um, something that, that Dirk's mentioned that I was involved with. This was a, an, uh, an outbreak of avian influenza in a Hubara breeding project in the Middle East. We had 3,000 Hubaras, uh, female Hubaras, and, and obviously males as well. And, and they were um, contained in 
big buildings, 100 meters by 30 meters. We had six of these buildings um, and, and infection just going right through the whole lot. And admittedly, OK, we did treat all the birds with Tamiflu. Um, we did put in good biosecurity. But what, to my mind, that would not have worked alone if we had not installed this fogging system. So on the left hand side, we see a compressed air multi-port um, stat static uh, fogging unit and we had these situated every 10 meters down the room and uh, three different columns uh, across the room as well so the image on the right is one of these rooms individual cages with Hubara in here and I'm absolutely convinced I mean I can be honest and say when, when I arrived we had birds dropping like flies with avian influenza all confirmed on PCR and so forth within 48 hours of starting Tamiflu um, and then instigating the uh, the F10 fogging, uh, that whole thing completely stopped. You know, everyone in avian medicine thinks about avian influenza as something you destroy the whole lot. But with conservationally important and valuable birds, that wasn't an option. And it just shows you how powerful uh, avian uh, F10 uh, fogging can be in damping down the spread of infection between birds. And from my point of view, Dirk's mentioned PBFD and PBFB, you know, it, it's a bit like feline leukemia in cats. So many birds have PBFD without the owner, and very often one has to say without veterinary surgeons being aware that there's anything wrong with them. So they may have the disease for a year or 18 months. As Dirk said, they shed the virus from the feather dust and as a, a respiratory secretion. And most people think they look normal. Now, in fact, of course, with this bird, the take home message is we see a black shiny beak. And that occurs because the first feathers to suffer feather dystrophy are the powder down feathers, the ones that the bird would normally grind up to use as dry lubrication in the preening. So instead of a gray dusty beak, we see a black shiny beak, a very good clue that the bird has PBFD. And then just other pictures here, uh, the cockatoo on the right, we see severe feather dystrophy over the head, we see beak abnormalities, and then the grey below, we have abnormal red coloration of the feathers. That can happen, can happen, gen the, can happen genetically, but um, it can also be a, a very common indicator of PBFD. So remember, cystine beacon feather disease causes immune suppression. Um, it's caused by circovirus, and that virus, as Dirk said, is very, very resistant, and it can survive in the environment for up to two years. So really what I want to share with you here is every time a bird comes into your practice, maybe for a beacon nail clip, it could be carrying circovirus. It could look completely normal. It shakes its feathers, it ruffles its feathers, it flaps its wings a bit, and dust, infected particles, then go on top of the cupboards, in the little nooks and crevices, in your consulting area, in your clinical area, and can remain an infective risk for every other bird coming through there for the next two years. So to my mind, the only way to control that is F10 fogging on a regular routine basis. And you also write down the days on which you did it, because heaven forbid someone brings a healthy bird into a veterinary practice or buys a healthy bird from a pet store and takes it home to another collection, maybe you know, into a collection of maybe 50 or 100 birds that are all healthy and introduce cystine beacon feather disease with it. So there's a real responsibility for veterinary surgeons. D don't wait till you think there's a problem. This is something you have to control on a regular basis. So to my mind, that is a real great place for the use of F10 fogging, not only in veterinary facilities, but also in pet stores uh, to, to prevent and control PBFD. So poll, qu poll question three here, which statement is most accurate in respect to cystine beacon feather disease? A, this viral disease only affects Amazon parrots and is of no concern in African gay parrots or cockatoos. It is caused by circovirus, which is only viable outside the host for 30 days. B, it is always visually apparent if a bird is affected by PBFD due to the characteristic feather changes. Or C, PBFD is a problem in pet stores and breeding collections, but is of no concern in veterinary establishments. Wiping down all surfaces with F10 SC 1 in 250 will control infective particles. Or D, PBFD caused by circovirus is a clinical issue in African, 
in, in Africa and Australia, but not in other areas of the world. Or E, this is a highly contagious, typically fatal disease of parrots spread by feather virus particles in feather dust, which remain viable in the environment for up to two years. So hopefully a nice straightforward um, uh, poll there, uh, but just really to, to stress the absolutely important point of how horrible PBFD is and how it is everyone's responsibility to uh, control infection in whatever, whether you're talking about a big breeding collection or uh, a pet store or a veterinary practice. So, so we've got about 62 votes already cast. Yeah, that's good. So everyone's everyone's on the ball there. I don't think we need to go through the rest. They're all pretty obviously wrong. And, uh, and mm -hmm. E is uh, a, a good answer. So well done, guys. And uh, we'll, I think uh, we'll, we'll come back to just touch on PBFD a little bit later as well. Okay, Dirk also mentioned chlamydia. And of course, chlamydia is another disease which is spread in fecal dust and respiratory secretions and also feather dust. Um, it's a potentially fatal zoonotic infection. Uh, remember, potentially fatal zoonotic infection. Uh, I have clients who have died of it. Um, Infection is spread, as say, in feather and fecal dust. Once treated, birds have little protective immunity and can become reinfected again from their own environment. Birds no longer shed chlamydia 48 hours after the start of therapy. But remember, therapy generally will last for either 21 or 45 days, depending how you're treating. And I would suggest to all clinicians who are trying to manage chlamydia, firstly, if one bird tests positive, every other bird in the same airspace should be treated as well. But really importantly, to loan the owners a fogger and F10 to sanitize the airspace and any other bird-related airspace that could, that could also be infected uh, to manage the contamination of, of that environment and to help prevent uh, reinfection. So uh, say it's another situation. And of course, the pet store is, is equally important. So when you're dealing with animals coming, birds coming into a pet store, hopefully you've got a quarantine room where birds perhaps are treated for a period of time before they go out on the shop floor. And really important to my mind to be fogging three times a day for 30 minutes to minimize the uh, spread of any pathogens in that situation. And the real risk, you know, we talk about you, you buy an expensive bird, a macaw, a cockatoo, a, a parrot, and you expect that to have been tested for chlamydia. But of course, those little cheap birds, the budgerigars, the parakeets, the cockatiels, the lovebirds, they're not going to have been tested. So very often, the biggest risk in a pet store is not the parrots, the macaws, and the cockatoos. It's actually those little birds that have never been tested. And of course, don't forget, if you're using F10 in a pet store, you can, of course, also use it for rodents, for rabbits, for chelonia. All of those uh, groups of animals uh, have respiratory infection where F10 is also useful. And of course, ringworm. Ringworm can be an issue in birds, but certainly a bigger issue in some of these small fluffy mammals. So just to, to give you a couple of cases here, um, the, the first one on the right-hand side, this is what is termed SCUD, a superficial chronic ulcerative dermatitis. Um, and some of those can be infected with uh, MRSA. Um, uh, there's always a certain amount of self-trauma. There's also always problems with uh, the, the bird constantly moving the wing, the wing that is trying to heal. Uh, and I would suggest in that situation to anesthetize the bird um, and soak the wounds, shampoo them with, with F10 germicidal shampoo for 15 minutes and do that once a week for four weeks, as well as systemic treatment. And also you have to manage the bird to try and stop the, the wing moving as much. And the case below uh, is actually an MRSA lesion. And in this case, we were applying topical germicidal barrier ointment every 48 hours, again, together with systemic therapy. Um, so Hamish and Dirk, if I could bring you guys in uh, again with this one, have, have you got any particular uh, dermatological situations where F10 has been particularly useful for you? I guess I'm first up again. Um, 
Yeah, Neil, I think in my experience with the Falcons and so on, the parodermatitis, the bumblefoot syndrome, which you will touch on later, sure. is perhaps my best example. We have multiple agents involved, not only bacteria. You've got yeast, you've got aspergilla, or well, yep. a fungi yep. anyway. Yep. So you need a real broad spectrum approach. The old, old 30 years ago, we used, you know, ointments, prenine and stuff like that. Uh, it's just not up to uh, up to the standard. And, and, and you need a broad, broad spectrum. That would be my contribution. Uh, I don't sure. really see the, these uh, scatter lesions at all. Okay. Hamish, do you see some of these cases? Yes, we do. Um, in citizens, yes, but we also use the germicidal barrier ointment quite frequently in yeah. turtle wounds. Um, in Australia, we have lots of wild turtles, and so they okay quite large wounds that yeah, we yeah. end up managing as open wounds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we use a lot of the germicidal uh, ointment. Um, mm. I think that as far as the avian cases, we manage them very similarly to what you have just described sure. here. Um, sure. I guess the only other thing that comes to mind is rabbits with chronic um, kind of drug-resistant nasal discharge. Yeah, yeah, and, absolutely. And they have those yeah. really chronic nasal discharges that you yeah. just have to manage for the owner so you don't end up with those really irritated rabbits. We use sure. a lot of um, topical and fogging treatments as well. Yeah, great, great. Thank you both very much indeed for your input. Okay, so moving on, and, and it's, I, I'm not sure whether this is something Dirt would have seen in the Middle East, but this is certainly something that we see very commonly, particularly with peregrines and Harris hawks, where we have um, an, either an inguinal or axilla, uh, axillary malesthesia infection. So we, you get a scurfy, yellow, fairly smelly um, inflammatory uh, dermatitis. Um, and if left untreated, uh, over a period of months, this will then trigger a squamous cell carcinoma uh, in that same area. Now, thankfully, these are only locally malignant tumors, and they are do do lend themselves well to total surgical uh, removal. Um, but of course, the key thing is managing that skin infection first. And again, we use the F10 germicidal shampoo anesthetize the bird. As some birds you can do conscious. Again, wetting them warm water, lathering them up, and the key thing is leaving that shampoo on for 15 minutes and doing that repeatedly every four weeks and then making sure that the ventilation where the bird is kept is, is really good because a lot of these are sort of soggy uh, lack of ventilation uh, problems. Uh, you know, it's an environmental problem that's leading, it's a little bit like athlete's foot in, in humans. Um, that, that's what's leading to the problem. So uh, it's, it's a, an interesting condition and, and certainly a, a relevant application. Do, do you see any of those in the Middle East? Well, um, I think uh, one could make a general remark here that, that um, you know, hunting falcons uh, get injured. Uh, they get uh, injuries uh, in our part of the world here in South Africa, very often related to fences, barbed wire fences, uh, all sorts of mechanical injuries during the process of hunting with them. And that's true for all parts of the world, wherever falcons are flown and hunted. So as a general rule, and that's a take-home message, uh, you know, every falconer uh, and everybody involved with that should have a, a tube of F10 germicidal ointment with them to treat any and every superficial wounds doesn't matter what the original cause is, doesn't matter um, how complicated the, the agent profile is that you're targeting. It's just one of those general first aid kit principles. Sure, sure. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so moving on, and we come to Bumblefoot, which uh, uh, Dirk has just touched on. And, and just to remind everyone that the commonest pathogen involved, um, you know, okay, there's a pressure sore, and, and then there's a pathogen that crosses the compromised skin defense uh, mechanism and enters into the tissue, giving rise to a cellulitis and a swelling. And the commonest pathogen is Staphylococcus. But of course, the point is that Staphylococcus is not a commensal skin um, organism of birds of prey. The Staphylococcus comes from the falconer's hands. That's why it's there, and that's why falcons in particular are very poor at dealing, at their immune system, dealing with Staphylococcus. And so, actually, uh, applying F10 germicidal ointment to the feet of falcons twice a week to control the staff that tends to get on there. Strict hygiene, falconers cleansing their hands with uh, F10 um, 
uh, SC uh, hand washes before they handle birds, uh, cleansing, uh, gauntlet, falconry gauntlets and so on, all really, really important. But again, this is a, it's understanding where the risk and the threat is coming from and minimizing that risk at source before we get to a point where a bird is affected by that infection. And then when it comes to the treatment of, of bumblefoot cases, uh, certainly post-operatively, we use these donut-shaped uh, dressings like a big corn plaster. So we're relieving the pressure from the ball of the foot. We're leaving a hole in the center to make sure we've got ventilation. But then we actually put F10 germicidal ointment inside that little hole. Uh, so that's in contact with uh, with the sole of the foot as well. And uh, I, I like uh, Dirk's comment from before where he said there's lots of pathogens. There are, particularly in hot climates. As soon as you put a dressing on a bird's foot, there's a high rate of both yeast and aspergillus skin infection. So, you know, don't wait for the problem. Always apply F10 germicidal barrier cream to the foot before you put the dressing on there. Uh, and that's really good to, to prevent and also to control any infection that is in there. So let's just go to our next polling question. Um, which one statement is most accurate in respect to the commonest pathogen involved in bumblefoot and raptors? A, E. coli is the commonest pathogen derived from food and as a result of poor hygiene in food preparation. B, aspergillus and candida species are common contaminants in bumblefoot lesions. C, Bumblefoot arises due to avascular necrosis, that's a pressure sore, and bacterial contamination or infection is unimportant. D, the commonest pathogen is Staph aureus, which is not naturally found on raptor skin in the wild, when in captivity, contamination occurs from the handler's hands and should be controlled. Or E, Pseudomonas species contamination of pedal wounds and bumblefoot in raptors is common as a result of birds standing in contaminated water bowls. So if I can encourage you to all place your, your, your vote, I was going to say bets for a moment. Um, hopefully that'll be a nice easy one for you all. It's fairly uh, straightforward stuff really, but it's just really important to remember um, yes, we've got to take the pressure off the bird's feet. We've got to manage them. The husbandry's got to be good, but we should be controlling that staphylococcus. And you're 97% of you have all absolutely with me there. So congrats, everybody. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, let's crack on. Um, so remote, don't, not forgetting uh, dermatotyphos phytosis, so ringworm. Um, this is a, a chicken with flavus. Um, as we said before, small mammals, um, guinea pigs and, and so on, uh, I get this much more commonly. But again, F10 uh, is a wonderfully safe and effective way. And you may say, well, what happens if you get F10 in the eye? It doesn't matter. We've done the safety checks and I'll come back to eye treatments with F10 in, in a moment. Uh, but yes, um, soaking uh, with F10 shampoo for 15 minutes, at least once a week for four weeks is, is a good therapy for ringworm. Okay. So stomatitis, so just looking in the mouth, obviously it's no great surprise. There's a whole range of different uh, etiologies for stomatitis in falcons. They can be parasitic with capillaria, for example. Uh, they can be, uh, can be uh, uh, cryptosporidia. It can be uh, candida infection. It can be viral infections, typically pox. Um, it can be bacterial infections, a whole range of different bacteria. So obviously, yes, you take samples, you do cytology, you do culture and sensitivity, but in any of these cases, actually using a mouthwash with F10SC1 and 250 two to three times a day, pending those uh, laboratory results, and even once you've got the results, using that of a, as an added treatment, uh, in my experience, works extremely well. And then having started at one end of the body, let's just look at the other end of the body. Um, in my experience, if you've got a bird with a cloacitis, so the top image there is actually a bird that has a cloacal urolith. So it's a big uh, stone of uric acid crystals uh, stuck in the cloaca. So what you do is you anesthetize it, break it with a pair of artery forceps and just take out the pieces. Uh, and the one below, there's actually, you can see the opening to the cloaca, there's a fistula above here and there's a whole lot of infection going around, around here. And in both of these cases, they, work, they lend themselves very, very well 
to daily douching. So just taking a 10 mil syringe with a, a stock solution, a 1 in 250 F10 in saline, and flushing in there um, uh, once or twice a day for a 7 to 10 day period. It's really, really good. And again, it's not a part of the body where systemic therapy is going to be uh, that useful for you. So it's a, another useful little application. If we move on to think about insect vector diseases, there's very strong evidence that amyloidosis occurs subsequent to insect spread, uh, spread viral diseases, pre predominantly a Middle East disease, um, but something that, that really is a big challenge for us. But of course, other diseases are spread by insects as well, West Nile virus, avian pox, um, and then of course we have the uh, hematozoa as well. So we have Babesia, Haemoproteus, Leucocytozoan, and Plasmodium all of them spread by biting insects. So, you know, what can we do with F10? Well, the answer is we use F10 insecticide surface spray. And if you have webbing material around your aviary sides and if necessary on the roof as well, and you spray the F10 insecticidal sp surface spray on these uh, webbing uh, panels, then you minimize the, uh, the incidence of these insect vectors coming into that environment and transmitting infection uh, to your birds. And I've, I've used this in many different uh, families of birds uh, with, with different parasites, penguins to falcons, etc., etc. So another really useful application. At this point, um, as we mentioned, Hamish's uh, research project for his uh, uh, Doctor of Philosophy uh, studies is Macrorhabdus onthogaster, and I'm going to pass over to Hamish to tell us what he's been up to. Thanks, Neil. Um, yeah, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Macrorhabdus or megabacteria. Um, basically, my research research has looked specifically at trying to establish a more effective treatment uh, for the macrorhabdus in an aviary setting. One of the things that we find frustrating in Australia, and I'm sure that you find it frustrating across the world, is that when a collection gets infected with macrorhabdus, it's very difficult to eliminate. And classically, we've focused really heavily on treating individual birds to try and eliminate infection, eliminate shedding, that sort of thing. And so when we look <clears throat> very broadly, the transmission between the birds occurs via a fecal oral route. So birds eating the feces of other birds on the floor or contaminated uh, drinking water, contaminated seed dishes, that sort of thing. And then also from regurgitant feeding. So adult budgerigars that are feeding young, we know that the young birds get infected between two and four days old. Um, and we know that those birds shed the organism very heavily in the nest before they establish this steady state where they don't uh, shed so many organisms after kind of 14 to 18 days in the nesting box. And so what we're looking at is trying to establish how we can manage uh, Macrorhabdus in a more effective way. Um, and so what we've started with is to try and eliminate the organism outside of the host. And so I can grow Macrorhabdus in the lab and we've been using lots of different things to try and eliminate its reproductive capacity. And we know that in a laboratory setting, um, F10 is very effective at preventing it from uh, multiplying and then also killing the organism and inactivating it. But it is a very difficult organism to eliminate in the birds. And so when we look at that, basically <clears throat> we have to take a, a multifactorial approach. And so we need to treat the infected birds. We also have to control stressors in the environment, decreasing stocking densities, having enough space that those birds are going to be able to, to, to manage those internal stressors as well as eliminating other stressors, nesting, any sort of breeding activity, cold stressors, things like that. Um, and then also managing the environment. And when we think of managing the environment, most of that comes down to disinfection and preventing reinfection of birds that we're treating systemically. Um, one of our major challenges is that classically in Australia, uh, budgerigar fanciers use a lot of different medication regimes um, and most of them do it without veterinary consultation. And so it is a challenge for us because often, um, you know, they come in and they have uh, tried 
15 or 20 different medication treatments by the time they seek veterinary advice. And one of the things that they do a lot of is use F10 in the drinking water um, to try and eliminate macrorhabdus because we know that it kills it in the laboratory. We know that it kills it outside the host. But so far, our trials have shown that feeding F10 in the water to birds doesn't actually eliminate their ability to shed macrorhabdus. What we do know is that we can treat them systemically and we get about 70% success with treatment with amphotericin B, but 30% of those birds will re-establish an infection by the end of treatment course. And so what we ended up doing was providing basically a multifactorial uh, approach. And exactly what we've talked about here is that you treat the bird systemically and then you also have to treat the environment. And so that basically involves disinfection reducing stocking densities, reducing breeding stresses, making sure that we're providing appropriate nutrition, good air quality, filtering the air, making sure that the birds aren't stressed by having high aspergillus load or having chlamydiosis in the collection as well. And so dealing with all of those secondary things and probably to be fair, the most common thing that we see in Australia in budgerigars, but also other small citizens is concurrent infection with chlamydia and concurrent infection with circovirus or cytosine beacon feather disease. Um, polyomavirus is also very common. And so we work to try and reduce the pathogen load in these collections. And then what we try and do is manage the environment. And so removing the gross contamination, removing all of the organic material, especially the fecal material from the aviary floor. And basically that's a manual process. You scrape the floor to remove most of the organic debris. Um, and then remove all of the seed from the corners and the feather dander from the, the crevices between uh, the aviary wire and the, the floor. And then we go ahead and we remove the pathogens using disinfection. And so we can use things like F10 at 1 to 250. I know in the lab that F10 inactivates macrorhabdus at 1 to 500, but in organic material and in an aviary setting, uh, removing those pathogens is more difficult. And so 1 to 250 is very effective with F10 XD. Um, and then we go ahead and we spray or fog. And most of the time, to be fair, we're fogging these aviaries and making the, the, the surface of the, the aviary floor uh, moist and letting that dry before we go ahead and we apply a second application. Um, and what that does is basically you eliminate the organic debris and then you eliminate the pathogen the first time. And then finally you follow up with a complete treatment to know that you're not going to have those birds going down to the floor, ingesting fecal material that's contaminated and then reinfecting themselves and starting that cycle all over again. And so it is an incredibly difficult pathogen, um, but what we know our research so far is that we can kill it in the bird it's difficult to do but we can do it and then one of the most important management techniques is actually taking a holistic approach rather than just focusing on the individual patient and i think that's probably the big take-home message from from me is that f10 is an adjunct to a lot of the therapies that we want to be doing with these birds and basically it provides one of the keys to success to make sure that we get a good successful outcome in these aviary situations as well as in pet birds if we're treating individual eliminating that pathogen from the environment prevents reinfestation and it helps them to get better longer term so we do have a poll question and i'll let neil run this because he's done such a good okay. job with the polls <laughs> thank, thank you very much indeed, Hamish, uh, for for uh, a lovely insight. And and as ever, you know, Dirk has said, you've said, I've said, it's about understanding the whole scenario, looking at the causes, the underlying, the holistic, the whole picture, uh, not just giving the betel because the the animal suffering from betel deficiency, but actually looking at the cause and uh, reducing stress, getting the nutrition right, and controlling infection. So anyway, on to the poll. Which statement is most true? in respect to Mactorhabdus ornithogaster, also known as Megabacteria and Avery gastric yeast, infection in budrigars. A, the disease is readily controlled with amphotericin in the drinking water for all birds in the group for 30 days. B, the disease occurs due to a reduction in the natural production of gastric acid. Adding cider vinegar to drinking water resolves the disease. C, Birds with this disease are suffering from betrol deficiency. When given in drinking water for seven days, it resolves the problem. 
D, this disease is challenging to treat, whilst oral antifungal agents are useful, highly effective environmental cleaning and disinfection with an effective agent, e.g. F10SC, is necessary. Or E, the gastric yeast is naturally occurring on the skin of fruit fed to birds. If you convert the bird to a seed-only diet, the problem resolves. So, poll away, everybody. I'm, I'm really impressed how quickly everyone polls here. And look at that. Ah, oh, Hamish, you've done a fantastic job. A hundred percent. That's a first for the evening. Well done, man. Okay, so great. G glad you're all with us still, everybody. So let's crack on. We'll show you a few more uh, clinical situations. So uh, you may not be able to see terribly well. This was a bird. Uh, I think it was probably a buzzard. And the yellow arrows are pointing at maggots. So fly striking birds is not common, but it does occur. And in which case the use of F10 germicidal spray with insecticide is invaluable. Just remember it's one pump per kilogram body weight. So you don't go wetting the whole of the, the, uh, the carcass or the lesion. It's just one pump um, because we don't want any toxicity problems. It's not the F10 causing toxicity, it's the insecticide. But it does work really well. You don't have to pick the maggots out, just one spray. It's equally uh, useful for rabbits and of course with rabbits if we're talking about preventing fly strike if you've got one of these rabbits that has to have a wash once a week uh, because it gets a dirty bum um, then uh, you, you can't keep reapplying one of these long-term preparations but you can keep applying F10 um, uh, germicidal spray with insecticide uh, so both to prevent uh, uh, fly strike in rabbits, but also to treat. Uh, it is uh, certainly in the UK, it's the only licensed product for the treatment of fly strike uh, in, in rabbits. So moving on with other avian cases, pedal hyperkeratosis, again, often a nutritional problem with zinc and vitamin A deficiency, um, often, I say, often linked to, to poor nutrition. Uh, obviously, yes, improve the diet, but also applying F10 germicidal barrier cream twice a week until the epithelium returns to normal is, is really good. You'll be amazed, just one or two applications and that skin suddenly looks an awful lot more healthy. Um, Likewise, if we have cracked, poor quality, pedal skin condition, this is a little cockatiel here. And okay, we've got a husbandry problem. We've got poor perching diameter or poor perching surface. Um, so we need to correct that. But applying uh, F10 germicidal barrier ointment uh, every three days or so uh, until the uh, pedal skin returns to normal is really good to uh, control any pathogens that may be on the skin and also uh, to get the skin more healthy. And then another pedal infection case, this is pedal cellulitis. We see this in water birds, specifically where the bird comes from a warm climate. I'm thinking about flamingos here. And um, the, the birds are then kept perhaps in a zoo collection in a temperate zone, and they're standing in cold water during the winter. The cold water means they reduce their pedal blood supply, and that uh, makes them more prone to, uh, to, to cracking and to skin infection. Applying F10 germicidal barrier cream twice a week is really, really good. The real solution to that is actually to warm up the water they're standing in. So if you can supply um, uh, borehole water, uh, you'll find that that is always three to four degrees warmer than river or canal water. And just that increase in, in water temperature will mean that the incidence will fall from maybe 90% in a group down to 5% in a group. But controlling that infection with the F10 germicidal cream is good. And just uh, getting towards the end now, but just a few more clinical cases. Managing pox lesions. Obviously, we know pox lesions are caused. They're transmitted by uh, biting insects. Um, they uh, transmit avipox, a pox infection. The infection is self-limiting in about eight weeks, but we need to control secondary infections. So again, rubbing F10 germicidal barrier cream in there every two to three days to control those secondary infections is really useful. Bite wounds, we, we're all familiar with bite wounds in our cat and dog patients. Uh, the top picture is a Harris hawk that was bitten by a squirrel. The, the wound was underneath its jesse. And the bottom picture is a swan that's been tuned by a dog. Um, so yes, of course, they're going to have, uh, they're going to debride the wound and uh, keep it clean and have it drained and so on. But actually packing these, these wounds with F10 germicidal ointment is really, really good 
uh, to, to control infection and to get some nice healthy granulation tissue going. Some of these bite wounds can even be, be even more challenging. This is a blue and gold macaw that I dealt with, and he has a bite wound through the top of the frontal bone. So this, this skin wound here goes directly straight through into the front of the sinus here. So you can see I put a drain through, I then put some orthopedic wire, I pull the edges together, and uh, then flush that wound on a daily basis with F10SC1 in 250, um, obviously maintaining uh, broad spectrum antibiotics at the same time. And uh, after seven days, we had uneventful uh, skin healing and, and obviously the, the bone healed. And moving on to this case, and this is a really fun one for me. Um, I was presented this, this um, uh, owl at the bottom. This is an owl called Mozart, a very, very famous bird from the International Center of Birds of Prey. Um, the bird at the time was over 40 years old and had bilateral uh, cataracts, which were removed by uh, a veterinary of, um, uh, ophthalmic, ophthalmic surgeon um, who, who specialized in cataract removal. And uh, 48 hours after surgery, the bird developed a really nasty conjunctivitis. And this was despite various treatments were, that were being given. So we took a swab and did some cytology and blow me, it was a candida conjunctivitis. Now the, the cytology slide at the top, that was actually a different case. That was a cockatiel um, and, and we can see uh, these candida lesions in here from, from the cockatiel. And you try purchasing an antifungal, a licensed antifungal ophthalmic preparation. It is damn nigh impossible. But of course, knowing the safety of F10, knowing that it had been tested on the conjunctiva for uh, inflammatory uh, response and, and toxicity, I knew we could use F10. So I actually made an, an F10 SC 1 in 500 solution uh, in saline. And we put that on twice a day for five days. And both cases resolved straight away without any inflammation or, or any uh, backward look. So it's just a, another interesting uh, use. Again, we use uh, ingluviosomy tubes to, to feed uh, some of our avian patients in. This was a, a Saker falcon, very well trained, um, had aspergillosis. We knew it was going to need to be um, given uh, medication, fluids, and food six times a day. And to cast this bird would have caused tremendous stress when we were trying to manage a stress-related fungal infection. So rather than having to cast it, we actually put an ingluviosomy tube in in through the, the crop, down into the preventriculus, and then take, taking the tube over the bird's back. And this bird would stand on my fist without any restraint at all, whilst we just pump the medication, the fluid, and the food into there. But of course, we need to cleanse that tube before and after use to make sure we get no bacterial proliferation in the tube, just as we would any other nasogastric tube. This is another um, interesting scenario. This is an egg peritonitis surgery. Um, and as long as the air sacs are intact, once you've done the surgery, you've removed the oviduct. Um, typically, there's lots of smelly, rotten egg yolk in there and uh, really um, septic peritonitis situation going on. Um, and so what we would do is, is, having done the surgery, is actually flush that out with warm saline, F10 SC at 1 in 250 in, in warm saline, flush that out. If the air sac is open, then we would just elevate the front end of the body so we could actually flush and then so I'd flush it in and then have a suction unit to suck it straight out again. And amazing the, the reduction in pathogen load and removal of fibrin um, that can be achieved. And I've never had any ill effects through, through having done that. And then just, just as we, we come to close now, we mustn't forget about the sanitization of drinking water. In the Middle East, there was a lovely paper pre uh, um, presented at the 2014 du Dubai uh, Falcon Conference. Um, and that showed that something like 35% of all bacterial infections handled by the uh, uh, the Souk Wakif uh, Falcon Hospital were due to pseudomonas. And this was all due to uh, water being stored in great big header tanks in a warm climate um, and pseudomonas growing in there. So um, using F10 uh, SC at one in a thousand in drinking water um, storage vessels uh, was, is really effective at controlling and preventing pseudomonas proliferation. So let's just do our last poll now. Um, which statement is most correct in respect of the creation 
of a biosecurity control process? A. F10 is such a wonderful, safe, and effective disinfectant that simply applying F10 at all stages of admission, treatment, and discharge will control any risk. B. Biosecurity control should involve a structured written process which all staff members adhere to in order to minimize the introduction of pathogens, the management of staff, animals, and fomites to minimize the spread, effective cleaning and disinfection, and the monitoring of outcomes. C, the correct choice of disinfectant to use within your biosecurity process is essential. This is best decided based on cost, color, scent, and how much you like the representative. D, biosecurity is overrated in these days of antimicrobials. Antiviral, antibiotic, antifungal agents can be used to control patient infections that might arise. Or E, when choosing an effective disinfectant, you can rely on the data and information provided to you by the sales representative. Okay, so just to get you thinking a little bit more on this one here, a little bit searching. Okay, well, that, that's really interesting results we're getting there so far. Uh, yeah, really coming out. So answer B, biosecurity control should involve a structured written process which all staff members adhere to in order to minimize the introduction of pathogens, the management of staff, animals, and fomites to minimize the spread, and the effect of cleaning and disinfection and the monitoring of outcomes. As Dirk mentioned before, you must monitor your outcome. Unless you do that, you simply don't know whether you're doing the job properly or not. Um, I'm sure that Health and Hygiene would love uh, to accept answer A. F10 is so wonderful, just chuck it around the place and it'll do the job. That, you know, lovely as we might like that, that is not the answer. You know, biosecurity is the whole system, uh, as Dirk has described earlier on. So thanks all for your input into that one. Okay, so before we actually close the, the meeting now, what I want to just ask Dirk and Hamish, and I'll, I'll follow up with my, my favorite one at the end. Um, Dirk, if you'd like to go first again, what, what is the, in your career, what is the, the case, the scenario, the situation where you've used F10 that was most interesting or you're most proud of or, or whatever? Yeah, thanks, Neil. Um, I think top of mind is usually the most recent, uh, most challenging thing <laughs> because obviously uh, over time you have so many other experiences. And in and, and the recent times I've been faced with this uh, cytosine beak and feather disease uh, issue in quarantine facilities, um, which really have a residual, as I suggested, situation in the air, air conditioning system. Uh, but, but it's a very, very complicated disease. Uh, you know, it's got vertical transmission, it's got horizontal transmission mechanisms, it's feather dust, it's aerosol, it's droplets. Uh, it's really different, presenting differently in, in different ages of birds. Uh, from acute uh, death in young birds and young chicks to, you know, any time at, at life, different uh, classic symptoms and so on. So that to me is really the most challenging uh, agent at the moment and where I've seen tremendous differences in, in uh, uh, places where we have that and seem to get nowhere until we devise a proper disinfection, proper biosecurity protocols, uh, you know, just look at, at the whole thing problem in a stepwise logical manner but we um, we're not there uh, we still need a vaccine uh, we still need other information but uh, at the moment I think F10 is probably the most powerful tool in the toolbox against circo virus great thanks very much Dirk how about you Hamish I think I can probably guess but <laughs> Same I'm, on, I'm uh, against the game. Um, I, I agree with you, Dirk. I think that in, in Australia, we have a lot of wild citizens that have circovirus. Um, and being an exotics only practice, we see a lot of in wildlife cases that get the next time, you know, five to 10 per day. Um, and one of our biggest challenges is having a uh, really strict biosecurity so we don't end up infecting the, the client-owned birds with circovirus from those birds that come in asymptomatic 
but exposed and carrier birds that are shedding circovirus. And so we use F10 fogging frequently after wildlife cases to manage that. Um, <clears throat> but I have to say my most satisfying cases are uh, in chickens, uh, chicken backyard poultry with pododermatitis. Um, when we have those uh, hens that come in with the large pododermatitis lesions, and I use a lot of F10 soaks, um, get the birds to stand in a carrier and, and soak their feet. Um, and it has helped to eliminate, or not eliminate, but limit the antimicrobial use. Therefore, we've got those downstream effects of not having to have withholding periods and, and talk to people about, you know, you're never allowed to eat the eggs again because these drugs are, are not allowed to be used in poultry, all of those different things. And I think that that for me has been one of the game changes as far as um, just changing the, the perspective on managing those chickens instead of aggressive bandaging, surgical debridement. We basically get them to stand in synthetic grass um, with a, a disinfection bath with F10. Um, and we do that for two to three hours per day while they've got their food and their water and they're happy as Larry. Um, but it just means that we can eliminate the need to go really long courses of antimicrobials systemically. Cool. Great. Thanks very much. And just, just to wrap up with my, my favorite, you probably guessed, is, is actually controlling that avian influenza outbreak in the Hubara Bustard because, you know, <sighs> All other vets in the world would think neck the lot, um, but you know it just wasn't an option. Uh, and so, having such a contagious, fatal disease that actually we could stop by just uh, putting in good biosecurity, change of clothes, foot uh, foot baths, obviously F10, um, but then introducing the F10 fogging and you know, admittedly using the Tamiflu on the individual birds to to, to actually stop, you know. A, a, an outbreak that was killing the whole lot within a 48 hour period was was to me really really satisfying and the other fun one which i mentioned already is the conjunctivitis you know how, how else would you control a conjunctivitis in an individual bird um so there we are i hope you guys have found that that interesting um just a a, a little message uh, from health and hygiene um uh, thank you very much for, for being with us. Hope you found that useful. Uh, this is the first of a series. We would welcome any feedback from anyone. So if you found this type of presentation, we've tried to keep it sort of interactive and informal. Um, if you found that good, then, then we would love to hear. If you think it could be improved, then likewise, we'd love to hear. Um, we, we are doing a series of six of these webinars. The next one is Herpetal, and then we'll be doing a small mammal one, uh, a zoo one, a wildlife one, and then an aquaculture one. So we look forward to welcoming you. They're going to be about once a month, and they'll all be uh, advertised, so look out for those. And, uh, of course, we, we would welcome you all to uh, fire any questions you like at us uh, about anything we've been discussing, uh, not just F10, but any of these cases. We're very happy to... Uh, um, to to give you all we know. Thank you, Dr. Neil, and to Dr. Favu, to Dr. Baron as well. Excellent presentation, and thank you so much for your time in preparing that. So we do have a couple of questions from our online audience. So I'm going to start from the first one that has been received, and this is from Anneli Klitter, and she's asking, is the rhino light related to a vitamin A deficiency? Yeah, the, the point that we were making earlier on is that, that we're, we're sure that the vast majority of those cases are basically seed junkies. They're, they're parrots that are on a sunflower seed only diet. And we know that any cysteine on, on a predominantly seed based diet will become vitamin A and calcium deficient over time. It may take some years, but it, it will occur. And as I said, vitamin A, the role in the body is to be protection of the respiratory system, the mouth and the kidney. Uh, and hence, if you've got a deficiency, um, it, it is typically an infection of those areas that you're going to see. So, yeah, we, we believe it's linked to that. And, and all of us uh, chucked in our tuppence worth, um, suggesting that, you know, good, broad, good, good uh, uh, nutrition um, with uh, lots of highly colored vegetables and so on uh, would would be a key part of the treatment. And I think so often when, when clients present birds, it's a case I always uh, discuss when I'm, I'm talking, when I'm training vets, is don't, th a bird presenting with an upper respiratory infection, don't think, okay, don't forget chlamydia, don't forget pathogens, 
but do think about the underlying cause and typically that is going to be nutritional. Dirk, okay. Hamish, anything to add to that? Silence. No. <laughs> no, I agree. You covered it well. It, it definitely, vitamin A deficiency is yeah. one of the things yeah. that you have to correct in order to get a good outcome. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you all. Okay, next one, also from Anneli. Can you please comment on the risk of microbial resistance to disinfectants, particularly if used so frequently as um, recommended? It's, it's a very interesting uh, point, and I think one of the issues is, is just to, to make it clear, there's disinfectants and disinfectants, and um, F10 is, is an unusual animal in that respect. Firstly, it's a compounded disinfectant, so it's a combination of biguanide and quaternium ammonium compounds, but it also has additional surfactants and various other bits and pieces to make those chemicals more effective. So the fact you've got two main actives in there means the chance of a pathogen becoming resistant to both is, is reduced. Um, but, you know, one, one should never say, a dis, I mean, we're not aware of disinfectant uh, resistance being there, but one should never think it could not happen. Um, Dirk, what, what's your take on this? Yeah, Neil, I think I would agree with that. I'm not aware of any uh, resistance per se. Uh, you know, and if we think about resistance, we normally have antimicrobials in mind, you know, plasmid-mediated transmission uh, between organisms that, that sort of take that information to the next one and, and steterocyclines and penicillins and all the lot. So disinfectants are completely different. We should think about them uh, also different to antimicrobials. The mere fact that we've got six uh, different components in F10 uh, makes that very, very unlikely. Uh, and I think if you see lack of efficacy in any situation with disinfectants, particularly F10, it is not resistance in the first instance. It is a maybe concentration contact time issue, uh, you know, so look at uh, organic debris and so on that prevents the contact yeah. uh, in yeah. itself, and those practical things. And if you sort those out, then usually your problem is solved. Yeah. And as we always stress, you know, cleaning and disinfection is a two-step process. Um, I'm involved with the uh, British Veterinary Nursing Association Biosecurity Infection Control course, and it still s staggers me that on occasions people starting the course do not understand the difference between cleaning and disinfection. And the whole point is you've got a step one is you clean, um, warm water, soap, scrubbing brush, you, you get it clean and then you disinfect. And uh, disinfection is not going to be effective unless you clear the organic matter out of the way first. Really important. Um, Hamish, any anything to share with us? No, I'm, nope. I don't have anything to add to your comments. Okay. All right. Any more questions for us then, Corny? A couple. Um, I'm just, we have a couple of minutes. I don't, I'm not going to be able to go through everything. Um, there's one from Matthijs. Does stuff, stuff always play a role in bubble food in other birds as well? Yes, it does. Um, not, it's not as significant. I mean, you know, firstly, bumblefoot is that there are, there are different causes in different groups of animals. So for example, in penguins, it tends to be too large a flock size with lots of interaction and a rough s substrate that they're causing uh, uh, irritation to their, their, their skin. Uh, waterfowl, swans and ducks and things, again, tends to be a rough substrate that causes the problem. So staph is, is not something that's sort of up there in your face when, uh, in my experience, we'll, we'll ask the other guys in a moment, uh, when dealing with uh, bumblefoot cases. And, and so, it, the, you know, obviously bumblefoot in, in birds of prey is, is the biggest place where we get bumblefoot and the fact staff is there as far as I'm concerned is because of the link the close link with human skin and and the, the staff uh, infection and there's some very nice uh, papers that were written years ago that actually show that um, staph toxins specifically cause a totally different pathophysiological response specifically in falcons compared with hawks eagles or owls um, and you get a, a very negative pathological response with uh, end arterial shutdown, ph um, phagocyte paralysis, macrophage paralysis, and so on. Um, very negative things happening specifically as an effect of staph toxins in, 
in falcons, which doesn't uh, occur in, in other birds. Dirk, you got anything to add in there? Your experience in the Middle no. East? Yeah, and, and obviously other parts of the world. Yeah, Neil, I think you're absolutely correct. I'm very pragmatic about these things. And I think for many, many years, people have studied the pathogens and tried to isolate the, the primary pathogen and so on and so forth. Um, I don't even worry about that anymore. It, it's really, to me, a complex situation in raptors where we know we have to uh, be effective against bacterial, a whole range of bacterial pathogens. We know we have to be effective against yeasts. Uh, my most uh, difficult protodermatitis case uh, was, in fact, due to Cryptococcus, mm -hmm. uh, which was a completely strange and, mm -hmm. and new finding at the time, um, and, and obviously also fungi. So, so really on the infectious side, I just uh, pack it with um, or address it with a F10 approach, depending on stage one, two, three, or whatever. And the rest of my emphasis really is on husbandry sure. and on sure. perch design and yeah. in breed yeah. birds uh, and in eagles in collections and so on, uh, movable yeah. perches and how you deal with uh, clipping of toes and uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. those issues, you know, and, yeah. and really rotating um, or giving enough perches and breeding joe falcons, for example, yeah. Yeah. and so yeah. on. So really spend more time yeah. raising those issues than worrying about which agent you're dealing yeah, with. Yeah, I, th I think you're so right. And in those different scenarios, there are different situations. I, one thing I've recognized is, is with the, the big eagle owls, where if, if they've got overgrown talons, then actually it means they can't uh, take weight. They can't bear weight on their digits. They take all the weight on the ball of the foot. And, and I'm sure simply overgrown talons is a major factor in, in the big eagle owls in them getting bumblefoot. Um, but yes, you know, they're, they're all slightly different. And husbandry um, and one thing I often say to 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 vets training to uh, to treat falconry birds is always remember that actually ninety percent of the cause of a bird of prey getting bumblefoot is husbandry related, and people say that bumblefoot is refractory, it reoccurs, it comes back, and you you send the bird home, and the falconer says, "Bloody vet, they don't know what they're doing." But actually, the problem always is, 90, at least 90% of cases, there is an underlying husbandry problem, whether that be perches, hygiene, uh, water, food, um, size of the aviary, uh, the, how the bird flies down onto the nest ledge with a thump and, and bruises its foot every day. Um, the, there, is, there will always be something wrong. And unless you as a veterinary surgeon find out that husbandry problem without totally offending the, the, the falconer in the first place, because otherwise they won't work with you, once you find that, you're okay. But if you don't find that, it's going to come back anyway. And I think, Neil, my experience in Australia, falconry is illegal, just so everyone has a background. You're not allowed to, to do falconry in Australia. But in all of the other bird species that we see protodermatitis in, there is always an underlying disease process or husbandry issue. And it might just be that the bird is obese. It, it's something very yeah, simple. Yeah, you know, you've yeah, got the yeah. kind of birds that sit there for their whole life with inappropriate perches, but they're morbidly obese. You get them on a weight loss journey, you fix the perches and the biotermatitis often will help to resolve itself. Yeah. So, yeah. And the, the other funny one to watch out for is when you're watching a bird that's, I mean, the, there's an old cliche, there's no such thing as one footed bumblefoot, because if one foot has bumblefoot, the bird will stand on the other foot more, that'll take too much weight on that, it'll get some bumblefoot on the second foot. But you do see some one footed bumblefoots, and if you watch the bird standing, typically they're taking their weight on the foot with the bumblefoot. Why? because there's something even more painful going on in the other leg. They've got an osteosarcoma in it or a bad osteoarthritis or something else. So anything that causes a bird to take too much weight on one leg, I'm talking about particularly birds of prey, you know, that can be the problem. So watch out for that one, because that's a, a bit of a curveball on occasions too. Okay, any more questions for us, Corne? Perfect. Thank you, Linda. I see she's jumping in to help um, answer some of the questions um, in the questions tab. So let's do one more. I just want to see what has been upvoted. Um, we have been using F10 extensively for years now. Has there been any reports of resistance developing in fungi, yeasts, bacteria, or viruses? I am totally unaware of anything at all. Um, you know, obviously, in my role as a veterinary advisor, I think these things would be brought to my notice. Um, I don't know, uh, Hamish or, or Dirk, if you've got any experience, I would just say I, I'm completely with Dirk on this, that if you think the F10 is not working, 
you're not doing it properly. You're not cleaning before you disinfect, or the concentration's wrong, or the contact time's wrong. And, and, and when I'm doing biosecurity and venture practices, these are the key things that people don't think about. One, th one thing is to identify, you've got to test, you've got to identify where your fomites are, you've got to manage your fomites, uh, but the most important, and that, that's absolutely crucial, but the other aspect is, in it, make sure your contact time and your concentration is correct for the likely pathogen in the situation you're working in. Hamish, yes, Dirk, anything to add to that? The only thing that I would add is that I've only recently finished my specialty exams and I didn't read anything in the literature about F10 resistance. And I think if there was something there, I would yeah. have read it. Because yeah. I feel like I read a fair bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nothing there. Uh, uh, is it safe? Is it safe then to use F10 um, to apply that daily if necessary? Absolutely, yeah. It's it's not a problem. I mean, people are amazed on occasions just just what you can use it for. So, for example, there are um, trials that have been done in the past where, uh, for example, flocks of broiler chickens have had F10 in their water for every day of the growing cycle, uh, and it's been used in ostriches in in similar way as well. And the strange thing is. How, how it works, I don't know, but without causing a deleterious effect on the gut flora. How that happens, I, I don't know. But I think, you know, I was interested with, with Dirk's uh, introduction there, his interest in intensive farming um, uh, practices. And I think, particularly with antimicrobial resistance, with uh, the problems with using antibiotics in food producing species, I think there's a tremendous mileage for uh, improving hygiene, improving air quality, and a lot of that is just ventilation and so on. But actually, um, I, I think F10 can be very usefully used in the quarantine process in uh, treating air quality where, where there is an issue and so on. Dirk, what, what are your views? How would, you know, how, how have you thought of using F10 in that intensive farming situation? Yeah, thanks, Neil. Um, I see uh, F10 in the drinking water more as an uh, emergency approach yeah. uh, or as in the example that you mentioned with the pseudomonas in the way it tanks and so yeah, on, yeah, so yeah, a yeah. constant reservoir situation yeah. uh, of that pathogen. Um, I don't see it as a uh, continuous thing. No, I know the no, cause have been done and so on, but I, I really don't no like one, No one would suggest no. doing that. And the point I was making is that it didn't cause a um, uh, uh, an issue with uh, um, meat withdrawal problems afterwards and, yes. and and it didn't cause any problems to the, to the birds but i totally agree with you it's not something anyone would would recommend to be done uh, as normal practice yeah I, I i like to see the uh, gut microbiome protected yeah uh, yeah as far as all uh, you know as, as far as possible uh, all health in intensive animal production systems all health starts with uh, digestive health so uh, really uh, carefully manage that. And the same principle applies to con constant uh, antibiotics in the feed, for example. It's, it's also one of those crutches that becomes normal, but you really don't uh, address the underlying issues. Mm -hmm. So I see it as, a, as an intermediary step, as an emergency situation. Uh, while with a fogging approach on respiratory agents, it's completely different. Uh, you, yep. You're basically disinfecting the air. You're bringing down environmental challenges uh, without any harm whatsoever sure. Sure. Uh, to the re respiratory system of the animals and, and, and the presence and so on. Um, and that really, I'm very comfortable in doing that on a daily basis, regular yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, automated fogging in, in zero tolerance situation, all of those things, mm -hmm. rather than um, you know the drinking water approach on yeah. a constant yeah. basis. I, I, I totally agree. And I think you know, in, in these intensive systems, the the incidence of respiratory infections is so high and um, the, the benefits of um, um, actually controlling that, um, cleansing, cleansing the air and so on um, uh, uh, is really so important. And particularly where, um, let's say, we were talking about poultry production, the, the margins are so tight um, the great desire to avoid using antibiotics. You know, all these are things that say, actually, um, you know, you, using F10 as a respiratory fogging agent um, to control problems. I mean, yes, have the husbandry rush in the first place, but it, it, this, I think there really is a place for it there. 
Yes, I might add, you know, you mentioned your uh, experience with the outbreak in, in uh, avian influenza. And mm. in my experience, you know, quail, for example, quail is a, is a disease factory. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just waiting to happen. Yeah. <laughs> they have the ability to multiply viruses better than any other galliform or any other bird, probably. Right. I've uh, dealt with the outbreaks of Newcastle disease and avian influenza in, in, in flocks of quail hundreds of times. And the most important uh, tool in the toolbox remains fogging with F10. You can cull and you can do all sorts of things. You can even vaccinate in the face of an outbreak. You can do many things, mm -hmm. but nothing is as effective as fogging with F10. Mm -hmm. So I'm really very pro uh, regular and constant fogging uh, rather than, you know, uh, in the drinking water. And, and whilst we're talking about these these COVID days and people getting around to travelling again, and this is something that that I, I've done myself uh, for for many years. Um, I, I did mention before that I I have previously suffered with sinusitis, and and certainly you know when I get off an aeroplane or I come away from a, a situation of lots of people where I think there might be a risk of some viral infection, just flushing your sinuses uh, with some F10 absolutely great you know it, it certainly you know i can remember those days when i used to get off a long haul airplane flight to south africa and and typically end up with some sort of nasty respiratory infection three or four days later don't do that now um i, I i'm not saying it's a, a recommended treatment for humans but that's how safe how much confidence i have in using it i uh, you know i happily flush my own sinuses with f10 Great product, fun there, Dr. Falls. <laughs> okay, so let's wrap it up with the last question from Philip Stapelberg. He's asking, F10-1-2-15 nebulizing is used in our clinic to treat respiratory infections in birds and other exotic animals with great success. How does that compare to fogging and can higher concentrations of 10, say 1 to 125, also be used with safety? Okay, I, um, so the first thing to say is that... Um, a couple of points I want to make here. Firstly, very I think very important. If as a veterinary clinician, you are giving some sinus flush for the owner to do at home, don't give them a bottle of concentrated F10 diluted in saline. So take a, a liter bag of saline, dilute it and give them the diluted bag. That that just thought came to me because we were talking about overdosing. If you, if you flush a sinus with F10 concentrate, the bird won't be good, I'll tell you that for sure. Uh, but if you use it as recommended, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, as far as the difference between fogging and nebulization is concerned, fogging tends to have a particle size of between 5 and, and 10, 5 and maybe even 15 mu, great great big droplets. It's, it's great for large spaces, but the droplets are of a size where they don't get breathed right down into the respiratory system. When you're nebulizing, you always nebulize with particle size 0.5 to 2 mu, and the smaller the particles are, the further down the respiratory system they get breathed, therefore the, f the more of the respiratory system you can sanitize using that fogging. So that's the difference between fogging and nebulization. And just remember, if you are fogging, the idea is not to soak the surfaces. Yes, the, it is really important you make the surface damp. And as Dirk mentioned, the lipid surface layer, remember uh, that is where the infection tends to be held using a degreasing agent on a regular basis um, uh, is is really important so you, you time your deep cleans uh, in proportion to the risk of contamination the level of contamination so uh, a dirty area you deep clean maybe once a week whereas a, a, a clean area you maybe deep clean less often so deep cleaning uh, fogging nebulizing can you increase the concentration you really don't need to is the answer and i personally wouldn't be in favor of going above one in 250. um that you know if you went at one in 25 that there is a point when you're going to get some inflammation of the respiratory membranes i can't tell you exactly where that point is um so i would just stick to the one in 250. hamish dirk any any inputs there no. 
the only thing that I would say is that you, when you go higher than that, and if you have a concentration error or something like that, it seems to cause uh, irritation. You fog yeah. or you nebulize, yeah. and the birds get annoyed, and you can tell something's wrong. So I yeah. think that I agree with you. I wouldn't go higher than one to two fifty, yeah. and routinely we probably sit around one to five hundred to one to two fifty for nebulization. Sure. Great. Well, on, on my behalf, I would like to thank very much indeed uh, Hamish and Dirk for being involved in this uh, uh, Three Musketeer um, Association that we've uh, enjoyed this evening. Um, the, the idea was to have, as I said before, to have people from different continents with different experiences, with different disease incidents. Um, we thought it would just be interesting to, to have a chat between ourselves uh, uh, about these things. And hopefully the audience has found that useful. Um, do remember that this whole recording will be on um, the Health and Hygiene uh, YouTube. And uh, sorry, I forgot to mention the very first slide of this presentation told you that if you're someone with, um, uh, w for whom English is not a first language, the, you, if you watch the presentation on YouTube, you can get a, a uh, simultaneous translation into whatever language you like. So that may be useful for some people. Uh, but thank you all for contributing. Do please give some feedback to uh, your your F10 representatives or to to Linda or, or F10. Um, we've in, I've enjoyed doing it. I, I'm very grateful, especially to Prod Hamish, because coming from Australia, he got up at three o'clock in the morning. So he's looking pretty perky to say he got up so early. So <laughs> I hope you have a great day. And thanks, Dirk. It's been wonderful. Your great experience, many years, um, really, really good. So thanks, guys. And uh, thank you, Corne, very much indeed for keeping us well behaved and, and organized. Thanks you everyone. are very welcome. Thank you, everybody, for joining in to our, our audience online. Thank you for staying so long. We really appreciate it. We still have 85 people online, and the discussion is really, really great, and the interaction is fantastic. So thank you to our panel of experts, also now referred to as the three musketeers from now on <laughs> forward, um, for your preparation and your time, Dr. Hamish. I'm not sure you're going to get back into bed, but if you do have a, a nice power nap, <laughs> quickly. Um, Dr. Nice. Dirk, have a great sleep, and Dr. Neil as well. Thank you, everybody. We have not yet received accreditation for CBD, but we are applying and we will probably get that before the end of this week. And your points will be uploaded onto the council portal directly. If you do need a certificate or just proof of attendance, you are welcome to send an email to conference at saivetcon.ca.za. From us, that's all for tonight. We see you again on the 6th of July. Be on the lookout for that email invitation. Please be safe, be wise, sanitize, and, and keep you and your loved ones well and safe. Good night, everybody. Have Thanks, everybody. Day. Take care. Thank be you, safe. everybody. See you Thank later. You. Thanks for coming.